I'd like to welcome you back into my shop. It's a beautiful day here in Wyoming. The sun is shining and spring is just around the corner. But today's topic, we are going to look at tools. And the name of this video is going to be Tool Identification. It's the third in a series called Fundamentals of Wood Turning. I'm trying to keep these simple because there's a lot of new turners out there with a lot of questions. And maybe the first question that they're asking is, what tools do I need? And I'm going to just take a look at the categories of tools, not get into any churning or sharpening or those kinds of things. I do have other videos on wood turning tools. Some of them are out of date, which means they're not in high def and they're not much fun to watch. Wood turning tools can be categorized in different ways, whether they're used for spindle work or cross grain work, whether they are scrapers or cutters, Many tools are called specialty tools. Those tools that may cut a bead or some other detail that is just in a category all by itself. So we're gonna look at wood turning tools and how to identify them. A lot of people have a question simply, what's the difference between a spindle gouge and a bowl gouge? Well, that's a good question if you're just starting out. So here we go. Let's take a look at some wood turning tools. Now let's take a look at the particular categories of wood turning tools. This is a gouge, and gouges are in three categories, spindle gouges, bowl gouges, and spindle roughing gouges. Many of the tools I have require a modular handle. This particular handle is made by Trent Bosch in Loveland, Colorado, and it's a really nice handle. Well made, um, not real expensive, it's high quality, now I mentioned modular handles, and sometimes it's a good idea to buy the steel separately from the handle. You can make a wooden handle, or you can buy one or two modular handles and just simply change those out into a different tool, or a tool with a different grind. And I probably have four or five different kinds of modular handles. Now you're looking at three gouges. This one on your right is a spindle gouge. This one in the center is a bowl gouge, and this one is a spindle roughing gouge. Now, differences and similarities. Each one of these tools has a flute, and I'm going to just mark that right here in green. Those are the individual flutes of each one of those tools. The spindle gouge has a shallow flute. The bowl gouge has a much deeper flute. And these two tools on the right are from one-way uh, tools in Canada. This particular spindle roughing gouge is my favorite. I've got a bigger one and I've got another one, but this size is really my favorite. I actually use this on pens. This tool is not for cross-grain work. And I'm going to highlight this again when I talk about spindle tools because it's worth repeating. So I want to set that one aside, the spindle roughing gouge. We'll look at that again. These two tools are gouges. And there are times when I use a spindle gouge on a bowl or a bowl gouge on a spindle. It just depends. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not going to get you in trouble and you're not going to get a catch or anything using what really seemingly is the wrong tool. But sometimes you want detail in a bowl, so you might use a spindle gouge. So there's the two tools and I'll... Now I got these two tools on their side. And what you're looking at right here, that area and this area right here is the bevel. And we're using a gouge, a proper cut means that you're riding that bevel on the wood. The bevel's touching the wood, and that allows you to control that tool. So, bowl gouge, and a spindle gouge. Now I think another way to categorize tools are those tools used only for spindles. And I'm going to show you some of those. This particular spindle tool is a skew chisel and it's not for cross grain work. I'll show you a close up of that and some other tools used really only for spindle work. 
I'm going to take a look at tools used for spindle work with a focus on the skew chisel. Now let's take a look at a cross grain turning. This is a little bowl that is not finished yet. And I think you can tell that the grain runs across the piece. Here's the screw holes for the faceplate I had on that. Now some turning tools, in particular spindle turning tools, should not be used on face grain work or cross grain work. And that's what this piece of wood is. It's a piece of cross grain where the grain runs perpendicular to the bedways. And we'll come back to that in a second. There's a spindle. And we can look at some tools that are designed specifically for spindle work. And some of those, and I think this is a pretty hard and fast rule, some of those tools should not be used on that cross grain piece of wood. Because you're going to get in trouble with the end grain. Here's a spindle. That could be a number of little lidded boxes or bottle stoppers or tops. The grain's running parallel with the ways of the bed. And when you're cutting, you're cutting across the grain and it's easy to do that on a spindle turning. Now, let's look at some tools specifically designed for spindle work. And I've already shown you this. This is a spindle gouge. Shallow flute. It works well for detail on a spindle. Now the complicated part of this whole lesson is this tool might be used on a bowl. There's nothing wrong with that. There are times when you need a smaller tool, maybe for some detail work, and a spindle gouge would work fine. You're not going to get in trouble necessarily because you're using a spindle gouge on cross grain work. Here's a parting tool that I think I've shown you before. And ordinarily we're going to use this on a spindle like that to simply part it in two to cut a section of that spindle with that tool. Now there may be situations where you would use this tool on cross grain work but you have to be very careful. You have to have this tool in a scraping position. In other words, held horizontally. You might develop that tenon or spigot for your scroll chuck. But if you put this tool in an upward position in cross grain work like this, that's gonna get you in trouble. Okay, you could do that on uh, a spindle turning but not on cross grain. The bottom line is the end grain. When you're dealing with end grain, some tools are going to be uh, a disaster. They're going to be a nasty catch in the wood. Now I also showed you the spindle roughing gouge. This tool is only used for spindle work. If you have a, a spindle of some sort and you're taking down square edges to round, that's the tool to use. Spindle roughing gouge. And there's kind of a profile. I can get that in the camera. Right there. Not for cross grain work. And again, not for cross grain work means that the end grain is going to catch in this tool this is a very weak area right here, this tang, and that is prone to break, and you're going to get hurt, not for cross grain work. Now, finally, the skew chisel. If you're looking for a superior cut, there's no other tool better for a, a perfect finish than a skew chisel. I like to compare a skew chisel to a knife. We wouldn't stick a knife edge into a rotating piece of wood. All right, that is a, just a formula for disaster and it's not going to be pretty. But if we're using this tool 
on a cross grain turning and there's end grain involved, that's going to also be a problem. Back to our spindle, the skew chisel is really a spindle tool. And you can rub the bevel and get a cut on that piece of wood, but you can't do that, you shouldn't do that on a cross grain turning. So only for spindle work, uh, coves and beads and planing cuts to level that off, this is a great tool. If we look a little closer at our uh, unfinished bowl here, the grain's running in that direction. So right here, you have a lot of end grain, and right here, you have a lot of end grain. So if I'm using a skew chisel with the bevel rubbing and the tool pointing upward, I'm gonna get a really bad catch in that end grain. That's when you don't use this tool. For the purpose of full understanding of this tool, the skew chisel is often used to form a spigot right here, but it's got to be held horizontally in a scraping position. But again, you have to be careful about that end grain. And if you're not scraping and you're cutting, you're going to get a catch in the end grain. Now, another category of tools that I think are very distinctive are scraping tools. That's one of my larger scrapers for the inside of a bowl. One of the big differences in this tool and other tools is it's flat on the top. It doesn't have a flute. So let's take a closer look at scrapers. Now one of the most important ways to classify wood turning tools is to distinguish between scraping tools and cutting tools. So we're going to look at scraping tools right now. Here's my knife. And I can take this long piece of uh, soft wood and I can cut that wood at a very low angle with my knife. I'm, I'm cutting and I'm getting a nice shaving off that. That's cutting. And usually you can tell if you're cutting or scraping. If you're scraping, you're getting sawdust and not, um, not a nice spiral like that. Let's take a look at scraping. So instead of having my knife at a very low angle, I'm going to put it up 90 degrees or thereabouts to that piece of wood and I'm going to scrape. Now, there you can see the results of scraping. That's cutting and that's scraping. Sometimes you need to scrape because you simply can't reach an area of a piece of wood with a uh, cutting tool and rub the bevel. So let's take a look at some scrapers. Now I think the main difference between a scraping tool and a cutting tool is a spindle or a bowl gouge has a flute. These tools are flat on the top. Okay, taking a look at the one on the right, your right, I uh, have a little bit of a radius on the left and that's good for uh, inside of a bowl. Nice and thick and beefy, it won't vibrate too much on you. Here's a spear point scraper that I usually use in a skewed angle. In other words, this is flat and I'm going to uh, move that tool up to about a 45 degree angle and scrape at a skew angle. This tool can be very aggressive and you can get a bad catch with this. Here's a scraper with a straight across edge in the front. And I've got many scrapers. I probably have three or four with this kind of a profile, but simply bigger or smaller. And it's very important to polish the top of that. That's part of your cutting edge. And this last one is a negative rake scraper. Now the difference is I have a bevel on the top and a bevel on the bottom. And what happens with the negative rake scraper is it makes it less aggressive. You can get a bad catch with a scraper. And sometimes that catch is going to be worse than with a bowl gouge. So there are scraping tools. Now the next category we're going to look at are parting tools. 
As the name implies, a parting tool simply cuts a piece of wood in two. This thin one right here is ideal for that. It's got a nice long handle for good leverage and it parts off a piece of wood in two sections without taking a lot of wood in the kerf. This is a beating and parting tool. And let's take a look at some of the differences of these tools. Now these particular tools I'm showing you right now are what I would consider true parting tools where you have a piece of wood and you simply want to cut it in half using your lathe. This is my favorite. Very thin, it's got a nice long handle for good leverage and it doesn't take out a lot of wood if you're making a lidded box. This one is a diamond parting tool and perhaps you can see on this tool I've got a little bit of an angle stay over there a little bit of an angle on the cutting edge and that's good for different profiling operations. I usually don't use this tool for parting but it's very good for parting or doing detail work. This tool is an Ashley Isles tool. Very thin up here. It's got a little bit thicker area right back in here for stability. That's a good parting tool. This is a Robert Sorby tool. Another tool I like. And this one, finally, is one I've made out of a reciprocating saw blade. And if you do this, get a metal cutting reciprocating saw blade because they're harder steel. And you can just put that in your own handle. The next subcategory of these are going to be beading and parting tools. I would lump these two tools into a subcategory of parting tools. And they're commonly known as beading and parting tools. Give you a, a side view. This particular tool has two bevels. This one really only has one. One cutting edge on each one of those. This one is a beading and parting tool commonly used in the United States. Not very good for parting because it's very thick. It's going to take out a lot of wood from that lidded box. But it's also very good for doing a bead or other profiling operations on the lathe. It's used like this, not on edge. I've seen some people try to use it like this, just like that, with a cutting edge in that orientation. This tool is a bedan. If you look at other countries in Europe, England, France, uh, some of those other countries have their own version of this tool. So there we are, beading and parting tools. Let's move on to the next category. Now we have all different kinds of tools and all different kinds of categories for those tools. Some of them fit neatly into one group. However, there are many tools that really don't fit into bowl gouges or spindle gouges or scrapers, specialty tools. Let's take a look. Well, I've decided to make another video dealing with specialty tools. That will be part four of Fundamentals of Wood Turning.